Greetings. I'm Dr. Tama Bryant, the 2023 president of the American Psychological Association. And on behalf of APA, we would like to wish each of you a happy Black History Month. As we look at celebrating Black history and the living legacies of those who continue to contribute, not only in the larger society, but in the field of psychology. I'm excited on today to be able to celebrate Black history with two of our esteemed psychologists, Dr. Robin Gobin and Dr. Kevin Coakley. I will invite each of them to introduce themselves. Dr. Robin, you may start. Hi, thanks so much for having me today. I'm Dr. Robin Gobin. I'm an associate professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, also a licensed psychologist that practices locally in my community. And my background and focus of my research is really focused on um, promoting trauma recovery amongst folks who've experienced interpersonal trauma. So that includes sexual assault, domestic violence, as well as adult survivors of childhood abuse. Thank you so much for being with us on today and also for the work that you do. And Dr. Coakley, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Dr. Kevin Coakley. I am the University Diversity and Social Transformation Professor at the University of Michigan, where I am the Associate Chair for Diversity Initiatives in the Department of Psychology. I am very pleased to be here today. Thank you so much. And a big part of my theme on this year is addressing trauma, grief, and oppression. And the African-American community and the African and diasporic communities have experienced a lot of all three of those, the trauma, the grief, and the oppression. And at the same time, we recognize from the standpoint of African-centered psychology, the importance of a strengths-based approach, a strengths-based orientation. So while we recognize our wounds, we know that there is more to us than our wounds. And so I want to start off by asking each of you if you can share one or two strengths that you would note about Black psychology or the mental health of Black people. Uh, let's reflect on uh, our strengths individually, collectively, or even within our families. Uh, Dr. Gobin. Yes. Yeah, so one of the strengths that stands out to me when I think about um, Black mental health is is really the focus on the spirit. And so when I think about Black psychology, we, we honor holistic care um, in our community. And um, I know in some spaces we can be relegated just to our diagnosis or our problem that we're coming in with. But I like that Black psychology really acknowledges that we are whole people with the spirit. And we also have, of course, mental needs and physical needs and emotional needs, but we also have that spirit. So I appreciate that focus on the spirit and holistic care. And a second strength that I think um, that the Black community has in Black mental health is creativity. And so I just think when Black people are mentally well and connected with one another, um, there's no limit to what we can create. And so I love the innovation in science, the innovation that we see in community and the arts and music. Um, we're just so innovative. And I love that about Black Mental Health. Oh, thank you for naming both of those. As you talked about spirituality, I thought about the importance of us incorporating that holistic perspective in training and in practice. And then when you uh, talk about the creativity, I think about the wonderful research that's been done around expressive arts, including expressive arts to heal from trauma. Uh, and Dr. Coakley, what, what uh, strengths come to mind for you? Well, one of the strengths that comes to mind is resilience. You know, it's the ability to be able to to bounce back from from setback and, and to bounce back um, stronger. Um, you know, you, you can't be black in this country without experiencing a number of setbacks. Um, but it's it's our ability to recover and to to really um, continue to not not just survive but to thrive in this world and, and to display resilience is a very a very important psychological strength for many African-Americans. And then uh, another psychological strength, and I and I really you know, borrowed this from um, our ancestor, Dr. Joseph White, is what he referred to as the gallows humor. And it's it's the ability to, to laugh um, when we feel like crying, 
You know, when things get mm. so bad and we feel like we just can't take it anymore, it's the ability to just sort of look at our circumstances and to just find humor in what would appear to not mm. be any any humor at all. So the ability to to laugh and not, you know, and cry also when we're going through a storm. Mm-hmm. So the sense of gallows humor. Yes, I love both of those. It's so important that resilience, as we're mindful of all that we uh, as a people, as a collective have gone through, and then uh, looking at the ways in which uh, we heal or thrive or, or flourish in the midst of. And thank you so much for naming that humor. I think often uh, therapeutically, people can label that or uh, look at it from a negative standpoint, but I think it is important to see the strength in that, right, of being able uh, to say, I am not going to be solely defined by my circumstance. Um, and so that kind of internal piece and also the, the social connection of us uh, finding that humor together. So as we think about um, our both shared history and your individual journeys, uh, because for many, uh, mental health and conversations about psychology can still hold stigma, although we do see a lot of growth and improvement uh, in that area. I'm wondering for each of you, what led you uh, into the field of psychology? And this time I'll start with Dr. Coakley. Yeah, that that's a, a good question. Um, I, I think back um, really to my days in high school, and I remember going to a, a, a summer enrichment program for what they called gifted minority students. And I was, you know, really influenced by being in this camp, you know, with other uh, African-American and other uh, minoritized students from across the state of North Carolina. Um, fast forward, I went to Wake Forest University. Um, and I remember sort of, you know, going back and, and, and being a counselor for that camp because it had been so influential. And I think it was at that moment that I first began to entertain the possibility that I wanted to be in a profession where I can influence and help um, young people. And so I think that was mm-hmm. probably that, that probably planted the seeds for me that eventually would turn into a, a career in psychology. Oh, that's beautiful. And it speaks to the importance of exposure uh, because we can't pick a career if we've never heard of it. Right. And mm-hmm. so uh, having that opportunity and exposure. And then I love it being full circle of then going back uh, and being of service uh, to kids and working around this area of education, uh, which reminds me of uh, Sankofa. So for those who are not familiar, Sankofa is the image of the bird that is flying forward, but looking back. And it is so important for us culturally to continue to reach back. Uh, And Dr. Gobin, what led you to psychology? Yeah, so I would have to say one of the pivotal um, influences on my desire to become a psychologist was really my upbringing in the Black church. Um, I saw all of the the joy, the the social connection, but I also sensed that people were suffering. And particularly because I grew up in the South, there were some unique challenges that people were contending with. And so just seeing the suffering among people, it really um, put it on my heart to want to help. And the, the only thing that I knew of growing up was being a doctor, like a medical doctor. And I was like, that's not really what, how I want to help. I want to help people like feel better emotionally. And I didn't have like a, a blueprint for like, what does that look like? Until when I was in high school, my senior year, I took an AP psychology class and I was like, that's it. That's how I help people feel differently and help them to see the strength that they have despite their circumstances. And so that really, that's when when I really found that calling and I've been pursuing it ever since. Ah, beautiful. It is wonderful that uh, desire Uh, to be of service, and then looking at what are the ways that I can make a positive impact, right, to to make things better. And, you know, as we think about Black history, often if we ask children, and I would even say adults, to name like a great person in Black history, often there are the common ones people will name like Dr. King or Rosa Parks or Harriet Tubman, uh, who are phenomenal people. And I'm uh, happy to say there are also phenomenal uh, contributors in the realm of psychology. 
So I would love to hear from uh, each of you, one Black psychologist whose work you have appreciated and who more people should know about, uh, Dr. Coakley. Yeah, I was thinking about this question and it the name that um, comes to mind easily for me <clears throat> is Dr. Asa Hilliard. Um, when I wrote um, my first book, The Myth of Black Anti-Intellectualism, A True Psychology of African-American Students, I dedicated the book to Dr. Hilliard. Dr. Hilliard was an educational psychologist. Um, he had an endowed professorship at Georgia State University, which is where I completed my PhD. Um, he was um, also a renowned African-centered um, Egyptologist. And he was known for many things, but one of the things that he was best known for was his his defense of black students and their capabilities. And a lot of his work focused on the education of, of black children. And I had, you know, the privilege of having him on my dissertation committee. Um, I had the privilege of taking a class with him. I would go to his office um, on occasion. And every time I would go to his office, he would sit me down, he would pull up um, some a file and, and present me with some articles. And he would say, you need to do your homework. And even to this day, to my right, I have what I refer to as the Heliot file. And it's the, all the papers that he gave to me yeah. over the many um, visits that I went to his office. But he was so profoundly influential. I, I, would, I don't think it would be a hyperbolic to say that I would not be who I am today were it not for mm. his intellectual influence. So Dr. Asa Heliot would be the person, the black psychologist for me. <sighs> Beautiful. And it makes such a difference that that mentorship and uh, that uh, instruction and pouring into and, and feeding your, your mind as well as your commitments to your area of study. Uh, and Dr. Gobin. Yeah, the, the black psychologist that I would lift up in this moment is Dr. Paris Fenner Williams. Um, she's an ancestor right now, but um, I first met her um, at an Association for Black Psychologists conference um, that I attended. I think it was my first year of graduate school. Um, and she had so many titles, and I just loved how she, she adorned them. She wore them and embodied all of them so beautifully. And she also dressed really fly, too. And so I was like, <laughs> yeah. it's my first time I saw a black woman just kind of owning the space. And she was an attorney. She was a psychologist. She was a forensic psychologist. She was an author. She was a speaker. Um, she was a founder of a community-based practice in her community. You could just tell that people respected her. Um, she poured into her community. That's what I love so much about the work that she did. And also something that stood out to me too is that she was a Christian and she was not afraid to stand in that. And I think that so often... Um, as psychologists, when we're being trained, we're taught, you know, what's professional and what you should and shouldn't talk about um, in the therapy room. And so to see someone so unapologetically standing in that and saying that I'm bringing all of me on this stage, I don't care who, who, who it offends or who doesn't like it, but this is me. This is what you get. I just love that. Um, and she just commanded the room when she spoke and she didn't have to abandon any part of herself um, to show up in professional spaces. And so I just appreciated that and being a first your graduate student that was just monumental for me to see that um, example and to see that there is no one right way for you to be a psychologist and that you can wear different hats and you can take it in different avenues and you're mm -hmm. still um, respected in the field and you're still making an impact in your community. Um, she, I just really appreciate that about her. So I want to lift her up. Oh, beautiful. And it's wonderful to see the thread that flows from a mentor or role model uh, to a mentee, protege, graduate student, because uh, I think anyone who experiences you would describe you as bringing your whole self. And I know a lot of the work that you do is also uh, providing education about mental health within the faith community. So I'd love to see, you know, that you kind of took that in and, and have been able to run with that and now be an example for other people. Um, and as we are naming mentors, I want to acknowledge, give a shout out uh, to our, our living history and legacy. Uh, one of my uh, key mentors, uh, Dr. Jessica Henderson Daniel, who was the first black woman to be president of the American Psychological Association. And before that, she was president of uh, the Society for the Psychology of Women. 
And when she was president of that division, Division 35, she had a task force on mentorship. And I was in that mentorship circle. So as Dr. Kofi was saying, it's not an accident that I'm here, right? That people pour into us in particular ways and can equip us and prepare us uh, for success. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I want to reflect now on both of your uh, areas of expertise. And I know, uh, Dr. Coakley, you do a lot of work around uh, the educational system. So I wonder if you can share with us about how anti-Black racism has influenced the education system and what are some ways that we can address it or combat it? Yeah. Uh, and again, this is directly the influence of my my Jegna, my, my mentor, Dr. Asa Hilliard. Um, but, but I contend that there is no other group of students who have been more maligned, more defamed, um, more uh, misspoken about and mischaracterized than, than Black students in the educational system. Um, there are a lot of um, buzzwords that people will use, and, and when they use them, they are really speaking about black students. Um, and so I believe that there is this sort of anti-black racism thread that sort of runs throughout educational systems um, whereby you know black students are treated more punitively. They are not seen as, as having an innate, as what Dr. Healy would call it, the genius within them. They're not given the benefit of the doubt. And so they are condemned for failure before they even enter into, into the educational system. And so in many ways, it's almost a miracle that they're able to kind of get through it and survive, given all of the anti-black racism that is embedded within um, the, the entire sort of um, institution. Um, you know, we could, we could talk about numbers of um, black boys and black girls that get, you know, uh, expelled, suspended from schools at disproportionately high rates. Um, we could talk about the mislabeling that occurs to psychological testing, um, being labeled as educable, educable, mentally retarded, or some other uh, special, you know, sort of diagnosis that, that again, disproportionately impacts um, black students. And in my opinion, um, this does not happen if there was not some um, sort of preconceived idea about who black students are, um, that that teachers carry within them, that then uh, enacts in ways that that black students um, find themselves fighting the system. And so, yeah, so yes, anti-black anti -black education, anti-black racism, excuse me, is clearly um, uh, part of what Black students have to contend with and what my work has been dedicated to trying to address. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you naming the various ways that it can show up, uh, whether we're talking about, uh, quote unquote, disciplinary uh, processes or even the assumptions before people even walk into a classroom uh, about our capacity. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for bringing those uh, to our attention. And it is a, a painful reminder that this is not just historical, right? That we have faced these experiences throughout um, our time in these United States, even with it having been illegal for us to learn how to read. And then we look at now, as you're naming uh, the, the uh, educational disparities, and even in terms of the quality of education uh, that we usually have access to or do not have access to. So very important. And Dr. Gobin, you uh, work around the area of trauma. And I wonder if you can speak to how anti-Black racism uh, affects trauma survivors and what we can do about that. Yeah, so the specific type of trauma that my work typically focuses around is interpersonal um, sexual violence. And so thinking about Black women who've experienced that type of trauma, we know that um, there's mental health effects. Um, so there's PTSD that happens often, there's depression, there's anxiety. And I think what anti-Black racism can do is just exacerbate those effects, exacerbate the, the challenges that people have in, in healing in the aftermath of those experiences. And then 
I think about people trying to go get help. And so I think anti-Black racism can definitely impact the extent to which people are believed when they're brave enough to disclose the trauma to, to a provider or even to um, a legal professional. Um, I think that it can impact the quality of services that people receive. Um, there's, you know, perceptions that, you know, Black women can take pain and they, they're, you know, extra resilient or they're super resilient and they can take all of this on their shoulders and not kind of be impacted. And so that has a, a huge impact. The anti-Black racism has a huge impact on the way people heal. And then I think the quality of the services and, and the likelihood to be able to access services in, in the first place is impacted by anti-Black racism. And I, and I also have to mention too, just, um, thinking about the black community and when a black woman is assaulted, maybe by a black man, I think anti-black racism also impacts her experience too in deciding how to, um, take care of herself in the aftermath. And I think a lot of times black women are placed in a position in that scenario where they have to choose between their own healing and their own well-being, or they have to choose to protect the black man who might go into a legal system or prison system that we know is not fair and that doesn't treat black men properly or equally. And so black women are oftentimes placed in that position. I think that's a result of anti-black racism that's impacted. And so I think some ways that we address that is just talking about it, um, really being open about the fact that this happens, that this is still something that's going on and that there's larger systems that impact people's experiences um, in the aftermath of experiencing trauma. Um, and I think also in, in therapy context, we also need to not only be helping people to heal from the, the trauma related symptoms, but also to think about the impact that the system's having on people's ability to heal. And then also talk about what healthy resistance looks like um, and acknowledge the impact of those systems um, and don't kind of mistakenly believe that that people are the problem or they just need to cope better with the system without acknowledging how the system is impacting their ability to heal and flourish in their lives. Thank you so much for that and giving this specific example, because I think a lot of times people can assume an experience like sexual assault uh, is universal. And it is so important to pay attention to cultural context, the impact of oppression, and as you named it, affecting uh, the response they receive medically uh, from mental health providers and in the judicial uh, system, which someone some call the criminal injustice system. And so all of those different layers uh, affecting our, our healing and recovery. So uh, this is very important. So uh, it has been said that trauma can be passed down through the generations. So some people will use the term intergenerational trauma or historical trauma. Um, but we also uh, note that healing can be passed down. And so I wonder, as you think about those two threads, intergenerational trauma and intergenerational healing or historical uh, wisdom, cultural, ancestral wisdom, uh, what may come to mind for both of you. And I'll start with Dr. Gobin. Yeah, so I think what comes up for me when I reflect on this question is that we have to remember who we are as, as Black people. I think we have to remember our lineage and how powerful and brilliant and resilient we are because of the people who came before us. And so I think when we set aside the busyness of life, that often distracts us from remembering who we are at the core. And we start having conversations with our elders and our communities. We can really tap into some of the healing practices that have been passed down and that have been there for generations, whether that be dance, prayer, meditation, testimony, or simply being in community with others over a good meal. And so I think we just have to stop in and remember, and that requires us to slow down, um, let go of some of the busyness and, and have conversation and be in community with each other. Yes. Slow down, slow down. And, you know, this is that's so significant because we're in uh, this time, I would say, as a society and also culturally where there is that perpetual pressure to produce. And, you know, uh, Trisha Hersey in her book, Rest as Resistance, talks about it being like a radical revolutionary act for us to be still in particular when our labor has all, um, 
throughout our time here has been equated with our worthiness, right? So to be busy, to hustle, to grind, and as you say, slow down and remember, right? I love that. Uh, Dr. Coakley. You know, when I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, that Dr. Gobin went first because he, it, it allowed me some more time to think about what I wanted to say. Um, but I'm reminded of, of, you know, an expression. I don't know if it's a, a black expression or just an expression that people who are church going say, but, you know, remembering not only sort of who we are, but whose we are, you know, that mm. I, I, and, and yes. I think that for black folks, that is so incredibly important. It, it speaks to a connection to you know, obviously our spirituality. It speaks to a connection to a higher force outside of ourselves. And I think for, for many black folks, that has always been a part of, of our healing, that, mm-hmm. that whatever trauma, uh, and we've experienced a lot of trauma, you know, in this country, whatever trauma we've gone through, it's remembering not only sort of who we are, but whose we are, and that, that God has never left us in the midst of all mm-hmm. of the turmoil and, and that, that we have faced. And so, so to me, that is something that I think, when I think about the experience of black people, that, that saying just really sort of came to mind. And um, I think it, it has really mm-hmm. sustained us. Yes, I think that's so important because as we consider uh, enslavement and Jim Crow and uh, police brutality, all of these are aimed at uh, dehumanizing. And so the the pushback against the dehumanization is uh, embracing and holding on to our sacredness. We say like whose we are, that we are sacred beings uh, and not uh, objects or tools for uh, to be of service to everybody else, right? But that in and of ourselves, uh, we are we are sacred. So I, I love those, and I want to ask as we, you know, we look at the news and there just continue to be attacks and racism showing up in all of these different disciplines and on the political landscape. I'm wondering in this season, uh, what what gives you hope uh, for us as a people in particular, uh, Dr. Gobin? Yeah, you know what? What gives me hope, I think, is is our our resilience and our spirit, the things that we were just talking about. Um, you know, I truly believe that we are meant to experience more than the pain, the grief, the oppression, that um, God wants more for us than that. And so what keeps me going and what kind of sustains me, even in the midst of all of the trauma, grief, and oppression, is this belief, this passion to really help people access the joy, the pleasure, and the hope that can is, exist alongside the trauma and the grief and the oppression and really to kind of honor the duality um, so we can honor our pain, but also create and savor moments of joy. And so I believe in that and and want to help people kind of experience that in their lives. Thank you. And I think joy and pleasure are not always the words that are associated with our experience. And it is so important, right, for us to cultivate it, recognize it, see it and you know, whenever people talk about uh, Black joy, I think about even at protest marches, people breaking out in dance and in song. Uh, it goes back to that humor. I think Dr. Coakley was speaking about that while we are, like are marching for our lives, also connecting to our lives, right? That that wellspring um, uh, and vitality. So yes, thank you for for naming that. And Dr. Coakley, what what gives you hope? What what gives me hope is the fact that we're still here, that we, you know, and I and you and our spirits have not been dampened. Our spirits have not been killed. You know, when when enslaved Africans experienced the trauma of the Maafa and 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 going through the Middle Passage and and all of the atrocities associated with um, enslavement, the one thing that there, that white enslavers could not do was to kill their spirits. They tried their very best. They, tr- you know, they tried to change their name. So they recognized that there was strength in their names. So we're gonna we're gonna strip you of your African names and we're gonna give you these other names. Um, that didn't work. We're going to separate you from your, your your families. That didn't work. We're gonna force a religion upon you and replace your native religions. 
that didn't work. They could not kill our spirit. And that is what I continue to see in us today. Um, I wish I wish I could recite Maya Angelou um, and talk about Still Our Rise, because that's really what we see with our people. You can do all these things for us, and still we rise. Mm, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I, I love that. And it is true as we look back on our history. Um, it really is that template, that model, that example of if they could survive all of that and create uh, even the institutions that we created, uh, it's, it's a marvel and that that's our heritage, our legacy, that we are connected to that. We, uh, that is us. And so uh, I appreciate you naming that. And I want to add for my hope, I'm so excited about uh, within the field of psychology, our students. I mean, you know, we have students who are passionate, on fire, uh, clear, have great consciousness and commitment. And so it allows us to know that this work will continue and even elevate uh, and it's it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to see um, people coming into the truth of who they are and who we who we are, despite everything that's happening around us. Uh, so we want to continue to do that work. Well, as we prepare to close, I want to thank both of you for being with me, and I am someone who loves uh, proverbs and poems and music. And so I would like to ask uh, each of us, each of you, if you can share a line out of a poem. It might have been the Still I Rise, a poem or a song lyric or a proverb uh, that our audience can hold on to as we continue the celebration to know that even when February is over, we want to continue to hold in high regard uh, Black history and Black culture. Uh, so, Dr. Gobin. I'll leave you with, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. And that's from Lucille Clifton's Won't You Celebrate With Me, one of yes. my favorite poets and poems. I love it. It failed. It failed. All of it. <laughs> We're still here. All right, Dr. Coakley. This one was easy for me, and it would be the um, Ubuntu proverb, I am because we are, and because we are, therefore I am. I live my life according to that proverb. Ah, beautiful. That reminder that we are interconnected and uh, we, our liberation is tied into each other's. And so I want to encourage everyone who is watching on today. One, we want to appreciate you for celebrating with us. And I want to very uh, clearly and intentionally say that this celebration is not just for Black people, but that all peoples should really learn about, study, and appreciate Black history broadly, but also the contributions of Black people to psychology. Thank you both so much, and thank you all for tuning in. Take good care.